the Louisiana coast is constantly changing. And like the Mississippi Delta itself, coastal culture is dynamic and forceful. In the years since we visited St. Bernard Parish, an incredible transformation has taken place. A transformation that took a year of visits to understand. Even our understanding of history changed. Sugar as we know it started here in St. Bernard. Yes, an American industry started here in St. Bernard because this is where the first sugar was granulated. And most people don't know that. Nobody knows Solis, Antonio Mendez, or more importantly, Moran, the slave who had the knowledge on how to do it. He knew the key. So the sugar festival is actually just sweet revenge for not getting the enough credit we deserve. <laughs> it's time for our just desserts. Extra sugar. Extra sugar. High five me for extra sugar. As St. Bernard takes a trip back to the future to discover how the past drives the present and how today the focus Ready? is on action. I got five more minutes till I get gone. In St. Bernard, history is not confined to the classroom. Its heritage is celebrated in ways that are uniquely Louisiana. The Old Araby Sugar Fest is a confection of tasty treats, cooking contests, homegrown music, and a chronicle of the area's rich connection to the caramelized cane harvest. It's also a trip into the past with a trolley tour of Araby's story-rich cultural arts district. We have a wonderful collection of East Lake, Italianate, bungalow, uh, cottages, and shotguns along here. You know, it's interesting when you look at these houses and you recognize the, the layers of history. The layers unfold during William Highland's journey through Araby, revealing the stories behind the 19th century architecture. And of course, all of this was developed in order to provide housing for people who lived, who worked at the slaughterhouse. The neighborhood tells tales of early colonization, commerce, and revitalization. It's actually the boundary between two colonial land grants. And then this land grant, we've been able to trace back to the 1730s. One stop where we don't pass go or collect $200 is a visit to the quaint and quirky Sugar Museum, located in the old jail and courthouse. We have here a history of sugar in Louisiana. And here you can see typical images of a sugar mill. And all of this would be from the late 18th, early 19th century. Rolling past the Domino Sugar Refinery, you realize that sugar is still an ingredient in the parish's growing economy. This is the American Sugar Refinery. When it was completed in 1910, it was the largest sugar refinery in the world. Today, Domino cranks out 8 million pounds of the sweet stuff a day. That's over 2 billion pounds a year, or about 20% of America's cane sugar supply. The festival itself started off as a centennial birthday party for Domino Sugar in Araby. And it has been cooking now for over a decade, becoming a must for families blessed with a sweet tooth. You're just giving away Sugar? Of course, it's Domino Sugar. It wouldn't be Sugar Fest without Domino Sugar. Bags of sugar for kids. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. No, all the parents are welcome. Sweet dreams are made of this. Who am I to disagree? Who wants sugar? Me! What do you want? Snowballs. What about you? Cupcakes. Snowballs and cupcakes? Yeah. Both? Yeah. All right, but don't tell mommy. Okay. All right, because it's Sugar Fest. Okay. No rules. All sugar, all the time. Okay. Yes, it is a celebration of sugar with confections, cookies, and cakes. Extra sugar. Extra sugar. High five me for extra sugar. But at its sweetheart, 
Sugarfest is a family fest of things that kids love as much as candy. Winner! The girls love it, but I'm quite sure this is how Stephen King started. Right here. Clowns. Clowns. There is also the famous donut eating contest. Ladies and gentlemen, we have Mr. Tom Gregory with us who's competing in his very first donut eating competition, if I'm not mistaken. Very first and very last donut eating contest, right here. Here, all pretense of a balanced diet disappears. These holes are going down, or they're coming up. One of the two. There is no in between. Hey girls, don't try this at home. All right, my loves, don't try this at home. This is not healthy eating. There's a whole lot of holes that are waiting to be inhaled. One, start eating those holes. The thrill of victory and the agony of indigestion. Tom Gregory saying, what did I get myself into in historic old army? Some can meet the challenge and succeed. We get close to a win on this side here. Others like me concede to those that hungered more for the glory. There we go, we got a third place winner. Tom Gregory, you have missed the congeniality, but that's really good. Hey, let's give it up for our champion. That is not any way to enjoy a Gerald's donut. There's better ways to eat Gerald's donuts. Slowly, with coffee. Woo, sugar buzz. The sugar buzz will fade, but the family memories of a day will remain. A day where parents said yes, yes to sweets, and yes to the old Araby Sugar Fest. In the history of St. Bernard, there is opportunity. It may look like just an old factory on the Mississippi River, but it's really a monument to American innovation. This is the Ford assembly plant in Araby. Built in 1923, this factory helped to transform the world, and it may do it again. Today, the owner of the plant is Sidney Torres, and he's taking us back to the future. We are walking into the past right here. We Sydney. are. It's a past where a man with a revolutionary vision was changing every aspect of American life. What part of the past are we walking into right now? Well, if we want to go back to the beginning, this is uh, Henry Ford, who had the building uh, designed by Albert Kahn. Uh, in the 20s, Henry Ford determined that it made more sense to assemble the vehicles outside of Detroit. And so uh, he hired Albert Kahn to design an assembly plant, one of which was built right here in Araby. Why would he pick Araby? What was it about this area that Henry Ford would decide to build a plant in the 20s? Uh, location. It's on the Mississippi River. There's rail access. Uh, he envisioned uh, exporting the vehicles to South America. And uh, it was an urban community where he could sell cars. There was a workforce up to close to 1,000, which at that time might have been as much as 20% of the population of St. Bernard. And uh, they were actually producing record numbers in this very location of Model T's. The automobile revolution was something that was transformative economically, geographically, uh, as a result of the Model T in the affordability. People could connect from urban areas to cities. There became a need to build roadways. Along the roadways, they had to build accommodations, motels, gas stations, and diners. And, uh, you know, as they say, the rest is history. So Mr. Ford, had his assembly line right here. Right where you're standing. How many a day were cranked out of this plant? 300. And where you're standing here now, going back approximately 100 years, there would have been 400 people at any given time cranking out those 300 vehicles round the clock. But there was such a pent up demand that they still couldn't produce them fast enough, but in this very facility, they were breaking records. You have a 1923 Model T. I do. It was uh, built the same year this facility opened. And it still runs? It still runs. There it goes. Listen to that. 
pretty cool. Huh? I hope I start when I'm almost 100 years old. When you sit in this car and drive, what do you think about besides the difficulty of having the accelerator and brakes switched around? What do you think about when you're tooling around in a 1923 Model T? Uh, the simple life, <laughs> and also not to run into anything. He should worry more about his antique car when I'm behind the wheel, driving inside in a landmark factory designed by architect Albert Kahn. Albert Kahn was the most famous industrial architect of his time. He, in his own right, is a legend. Albert Kahn is the father of the Detroit skyline and built the city into a mecca of modern architecture. From the Fisher Building to the GM Building, to the Packard Automotive Plant. This is the Packard Plant today. Abandoned, forsaken. Its history left to fade and crumble. Because of people like Sidney Torres, this will not be the fate of the Araby Ford Plant. Now on a national register of historic places and destined to be an integral part of the area's continued progress, what do you see when you walk through this building now? I see a very historically significant building that needs to be historically restored, first and foremost. I also see, for the future, developing it as a sustainable venue for creative industries. And between film, digital, interactive media, combined with a large, multi-purpose event center. I see people congregating here. I see it assisting in redeveloping this community. Events and soirees already take place here, like this sold on St. Bernard Social that celebrated the area's sustained growth. Soon, tech, trends, and virtual reality will follow, all following in the tracks of the Model T. So you not only see the past, you see the future of this area in this building. I do, I do. Because the same things that made this location desirable to Henry Ford still exist today. The ghost of Henry Ford pops up right here, right now. What does he say to Sidney Torres? Go for it. The ghost of Henry Ford may not be here, but his spirit lives on in the future of his old assembly plant. The assembly line doesn't exist any longer, but you can feel the energy of what happened here and what might happen here. Exactly. You know, the spirit that you feel, the energy that you feel uh, is right in line with the vision that we have to create this as a hub for the creative industries. Is the creative spark you're going to light here in this building going to change America? I hope so. In discovering St. Bernard, you discover that a creative spark can ignite an industry. It can also make for a pretty good story. Two, one, go! As a top destination for the film industry, Louisiana has become Hollywood South, complete with lights, cameras, and pitch meetings. If I was to sell you on an idea that I'm gonna be 20 minutes outside of the French Quarter. I'm going to take two box stores and I'm going to build a film studio. You're going to say, fantastic. It's not just a pitch, but part of the story of Jason Wagensback, the head of possibilities at the Ranch Film Studios. An old grocery store. It's what it used to be. Now it's a place where Hollywood dreams are being made. It certainly is. It was one of Jason's dreams to create a state-of-the-art film studio that was affordable and conveniently located to New Orleans. That dream and a killer robot led him to Chalmette. Who thought that would be a good idea, to build these giant studios out of a box store in St. Bernard Parish? Well, I did, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Take the credit, sir. So I used to be a former location manager, and so we were challenged with finding practical locations and finding locations that we can build sets in. And I did that for eight years. I did it for movies like Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, 
Percy Jackson, The Sea of Monsters, did it for Twilight Saga Breaking Dawn, and a movie that brought me to this parish, Terminator Genesis. That movie was the genesis of the Ranch Film Studio. You had to understand the, the business was booming here when I had that idea. You know, it's been booming for quite a while. We've had tax credits here since 92, actually, and then we really hit our biggest stride in 2014 uh, when we became the best place to shoot a feature film uh, in the U.S. So at that time, we were really hot, and we knew we needed infrastructure. So when I came here and did a movie called Terminator Genesis, and I needed some extra parking, and I came into these offices and knocked on Mr. Torres' door and said, I'm gonna rent your parking lot downstairs. Here's how much I wanna rent it for. And he said, great, how do I keep you here? And I said, well, we wanna, we wanna build a film studio, so what do, you, uh, what do you take to me pitching you that idea? And he said, fine, let's do it. Let's, let me hear it. Six months later, we went into business together and we had Deepwater Horizon here. The blockbuster budgeted Deepwater Horizon proved that the ranch's 22 acres in the heart of Hollywood South could rival any studio in the country. So this is where the platform of the Deepwater Horizon was built out here. Right here. So we had five stack high containers that made in a U shape. It was a nice little public divide and they built the entire plaza of the oil rig. So all of the intricacies of that movie, all of the things where they were running and jumping and moving and explosions going off were all inside this space right here. They built on this five acre parking lot. More films and TV shows followed, like Netflix, The Dirt, and Hulu's The First. Movies like Lovebirds, Underwater, and the sequel, Bill and Ted Face the Music. What do you see when you look at these big open spaces that you've created? Honestly, I see a blank canvas for storytelling. I can come in here and I can be anywhere in the world. So I can build a house, I can build a hospital, I can build an apartment, I can build anywhere that I think I want to tell a story through, I can build inside this space. But additionally, I see a lot of people working in my parish and in this state in the thing that I love and hopefully they love as well. That spark of creativity can also ignite an economy. Because we built this here, we've had over $600 million, $600 million in Louisiana spend on productions that have been at the Ranch Film Studio. How much again? $600 million. My next question is, how hard is this cement? Because I believe I'm going to pass it. <laughs> <laughs> that is enormous. Think about that number and think about what it would take to replace that if we didn't have the incentive for film and television production to be here. With the ranch's success, the other LA has noticed. I've been asked to come to LA on several productions, but no, my home is here. I'm a Louisiana boy through and through, so my family's here, I'd like to keep them here, and like I said, that's why I'm trying my hardest to find the best strategy to continue making this film industry here in the state of Louisiana. This is a story of a local boy making good as he works his way up from the bottom. 2006, you're an intern. 13 years later, CEO of the Ranch Film Studios. Why couldn't anybody else locally do the same thing? Oh my God, dreams do come true in Hollywood. <laughs> it's just Hollywood South. This is just a stepping stone, my friend. Like I said, I have bigger dreams. I, I want this. What's your big dream? My big dream is to really have a content creation source, have one space where all content can be created inside of it. And I'm one of the producers of that content. I can't be the only one, but I want more content creators to be around me. They're gonna make me better. And they're gonna obviously make this area better and the state better so that we can become a digital media mecca. The ranch is not only in the business of telling stories, they're in the business of bringing dreams to life. I've been waiting for you. Not all dreams. As I found out, some are better left at the pitch meeting. Here's the idea. We got a guy who can't hunt, can't fish, can't cook, and he's gonna do a travel show. Boom, what do you think? Yeah, that wouldn't work. <laughs> as long as you've got a personality, we can sell anything, right? I mean, that's not gonna work too well either. <laughs>
For foodies around the world, Louisiana is a dream come true. The abundance of local ingredients beckons the culinary curious to dive into a dining experience like no other. That same fascination with food also entices chefs and restaurateurs to measure their skills against the area's gourmet greats. Because of its affordability and easygoing affability, St. Bernard has benefited from an influx of inspired chefs that are chasing a dream and contributing to the growing food scene in the parish. Chefs like Kevin Hackett of the kitchen table in Araby. This is my wife, Donna, and I. Um, this is, you know, for lack of a better term, this is our dream. Though I like to think of it more as a plan than a dream. <laughs> it was my plan to see what a dream tastes like. Frankly, every day I get to come here and do this, it is a dream come true in that sense. You know, we want to bring it to as many people as possible. We have people come in every day that say, oh, you know, we didn't even know this kind of food was in the parish. We didn't know you guys were here. We didn't know anybody had an outdoor court card. With two different but equally appetizing vibes for lunch and dinner, let me just say, the more you know, the more you like. So she'll be confident within her own pack. I don't know what's got for them. As jazz from the Belinda Moody Group accompanied the sunset, that accompanies my salmon en papillot. I began to realize there is so much more happening here than at your average kitchen table. It's more about the feeling you get when you sit down around that kitchen table with family and friends and loved ones, share a meal, talk about your day, talk about your experiences. That feeling is what we wanted this place to have. And that's where the name comes from. Why is your kitchen table here in Araby. Our kitchen table's here because we more than anything wanted a neighborhood restaurant. We wanted a restaurant that was going to be more than just a place where people went to eat. We wanted a place that was going to be a meeting place, that was going to be something that was going to foster community. And we knew that we wanted to be in a small neighborhood. And to be honest, the price. Rents are a lot cheaper down here than they are in a city. And everything is a lot cheaper than it is down here in a city. This is a town, especially here in Araby, where you can start something, you can try something. With a little bit of nothing, you can hope to make something. And the neighborhood has really embraced us since we've come here. It's been really great. You guys have made something here. So far, so good. What Kevin and his crew are making is a big flavor that is worthy of the Big Easy. The menu is eclectic and it reflects Kevin's wide range of kitchen experiences. But I've been lucky enough to have the kind of career where I bounced around and worked around a lot of places and picked up a lot of things. You know, I've worked in Asian kitchens, Italian kitchens, all over. So you take a little bit of what you like and you adapt it to what's around you. Since we've been here, I've really been into our local seafood and our local produce and everything like that. That's the stuff that gets me excited. It's the incredible access that we have here to the best seafood in the world, some of the best produce in the world, some of the best, you know, farm-raised meats all over this area. Historically speaking, it is often said that it was St. Bernard that supplied the food that made New Orleans famous. Everything came up the river back in the days, you know? So now you're just stopping it. Yep, <laughs> we're grabbing it before it gets to the city. <laughs> One thing is for sure, with a gastronomic giant so close, if you want to succeed, what's on your table has to rival the world's best. I think that the people of New Orleans and Southeast Louisiana are some of the best food educated people around. I mean, if you can make food that people here like, you know you're doing something right. You are doing something right here, I'm gonna tell you. Thank you. The food is not the only thing right about the kitchen table. That sense of community that defines St. Bernard is right here on full display. Nothing makes me feel happier than looking out that window from the kitchen and seeing people, a full dining room of people, cross-talking across tables, visiting across tables. You know, they, they made a little bit of a connection. And then it might be a place to come back to just to have a drink and hang out. I could do that, but I'm gonna eat. Good. I am gonna eat. Excellent. It's the least I can do. Helping a dream come true never tasted so good. As people and businesses move to the greener pastures of St. Bernard, 
so did many of the traditions. In an area that is defined by neighborhood bars, Pirogue's Whiskey Bayou defines what it means to be neighborly. The nondescript entrance disguises the true character of the bar and the wonderful cast of characters you soon will be calling friends. And talk about greener pastures? The patio bar is like your best friend's backyard. If your friend's backyard was designed by HGTV, it's an oasis on St. Claude Avenue. Since we're still in Louisiana, you know the food here will raise the bar with locally inspired munchies and sandwiches and the occasional seafood boil. And there is a little northern exposure with their Detroit-style pizzas. I would try to describe this pizza to you, but my mouth is too full of this Motor City panned perfection. This is what a bar should be. And if it seems like this bar should be in New Orleans, it could be that the owners, Muriel, Lisa, and Kelly, earned their bartending stripes upriver in the city that drinks for a living. But don't look for 84 ounce daiquiris here. Pirogue's Whiskey Bayou is a clear reflection of Araby and its owners. It's fun, friendly, and quirky. Goes out to the glamour girls. And at least once a week, it's a mixtape of amusement. seem closer to an American Idol audition, but Karaoke Lou has a way of bringing out the talent, regardless of the singer's talent level. nights like this that have helped Araby become a destination without losing its way. Pirogue's Whiskey Bayou is true Louisiana, but it could only be in one place. Our year-long celebration and adventure continues on the next Go Coast.